O'Coleman. Um, Gerard uh, was uh, featured on Russia Today just one day after the, the terrorist attacks in, in Paris. And a lot of what he had to say really resonated uh, with people. And uh, just that short clip, just that 10 minutes of speaking in general terms about the background to what's really happening geopolitically here. Uh, it's been shared about a million times or more in just one week. So, Gerard, thanks for joining us. Good evening and uh, thanks for having me on. Okay. Could you just give us a, a brief background? Just tell us about, you know, your work. And we understand that you are a journalist, that you are a writer, but can you just give us a, a background of where you're coming from? I know you, you're based in Paris as well. Yes. Um, well, I write an uh, analysis, really, so the political analysis of, I suppose the best way to describe it would be globalization. It tends to, I tend to be concerned uh, uh, with countries uh, who are trying to resist globalization in one form or another. So, it might, so for example, I've written articles on countries like Belarus, Venezuela, Cuba, Syria, Libya, uh, Burundi, um, written on uh, different uh, genocides that have uh, happened, uh, like in Rwanda, for example. And um, so it, it, my, my, my work really focuses on the uh, disinformation that is spread in the mainstream media about uh, countries who are, in, who are essentially resisting globalization. And what I mean by that is countries that are trying to hold on to a sense of national sovereignty, uh, trying to hold on to uh, the basic, what we refer to as you know, social gains uh, of democracy, uh, such as pensions, uh, uh, raise, you know, raising the standards of living, raising working class wages. Um, most of the countries I've covered are, 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 are like that. And, uh, and the reason why they get attacked is because they essentially are trying to serve the interests of the people of those countries. So um, that's basically what I guess motivates me. It's just sort of uh, trying to document the enclosure of the world by corporations and okay. uh, the nation states that are trying to resist that. Okay, and um, but you're based in Paris. I mean, why, why are you in Paris? Are you employed there? Is that do you have a connection? Yeah, well, I, I work. I work in contract to different uh, different media organizations, and I've just been based here for a few years. Yeah. Okay. Now, as somebody who was in the city on the night, could you give us an idea of the experience of people who were there, and what in particular I'd like to know about were were people being prevented from leaving their apartments? And also, in particular, I want to know about whether reporters were being kept from reporting. What was your experience? Well, actually, I was in Paris when the attacks happened. Uh, the area where the main attacks happened, that's a part of Paris I do frequent a lot, but I, I wasn't there that uh, evening. <clears throat> but I was in another part of um, the other side of Paris, actually. And um, one, one, the kind of strangest thing that happened to me was that I, I was having dinner with a colleague, and uh, so from about nine o'clock, even earlier, I would say it was probably around eight o'clock because I left the house at eight. So I think probably eight, eight thirty till three in the morning. I didn't look at any media, didn't check any text messages, and didn't actually have any communication on my on my mobile phone on my 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 smartphone. Uh, like I didn't get any calls, didn't get any texts. Okay. And um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was at my friend's house and he was looking just to try to pick up the internet to see if he could, if he could get a taxi to the station to get the train back home. Okay. And uh, then he realized that there had been a, an attack, a terrorist attack. So it was at that, that point, so I didn't know anything about any terrorist attack at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there was no talk about it in the restaurant where I was. Um, and uh, what, what I found, what I subsequently found out when I went home was that at around 6 o'clock in the morning, I rebooted my phone, and then I got all these texts uh, and messages. I mean, you know, the family had been looking for me, and people had been ringing, and, you know. The, uh, but I don't know, actually, if this is my phone or not. I did read after that uh, communications had been cut, uh, that there had been a um, uh, communication breakdown in some of the networks. 
during the terrorist attacks. Okay. And I don't know whether my own phone. I, I have. I'm having software problems with my own phone anyway, and so I, I don't know whether my communication problems and connectivity problems were related to that or not. But I do know I did read subsequently that there were uh, communication breakdowns in the city, and so the you know the the, the so-called terrorists whatever were, were seem to have been able to do all, pull off all sorts of sophisticated um, stunts with. Uh, with the uh, connectivity as well, apparently. So that was my personal story with it. Um, of course, I, I mean, from, inter- from my experience in just looking at the war on terror in general, um, I, first of all, I wasn't surprised. I expected this to happen. In fact, I'd actually been talking about it in the restaurant that night, saying that okay. most like, you know, I, th- I remember saying to my colleague, you know, if there's another terrorist attack, it's just going to be unbearable. You know, things are going to get really unbearable. And, um, and yeah, I mean, they've been warning about this for a long time and talking about it. So it was inevitable that this was going to happen. So I wasn't a bit surprised. And then I wasn't a bit worried either about the warnings because I knew that, you know, most of the, um, warnings that they put every, you know, telling people not to go out in the street, this is just nonsense, you know. And the whole idea that the city's been taken over by, you know, an, an army or something like that. And so I, I knew that that was nonsense. So you kind of know when you, you study these things that, there's a lot of hype after them, and there's a lot of um, disinformation, and that, that that you know, in a sense, that is part of the terrorist attack. And uh, the worst part of the terrorist attack is the aftermath. You know, the the draconian legal uh, yeah. proceedings that, and yeah. the you know, violation of civil liberties. The uh, um, you know, they're basically just um, suspending the constitution. Uh, you know, military and the street martial law. And you know that that is the that's the terrorist attack. You know, you forget yeah. about whatever happens in a restaurant, whatever. I mean, if you look at that in global terms, I mean, how many people get shot every every week in New York and South Africa and you know, country Mexico, all over the world, violent societies where people are getting shot all the time and they get killed. Um, it's terrible, but I mean, it's you know, that's not something that happens every day in Paris. Um, but the, you know, the, the aftermath, the, 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 this particular period, this is the worst part, you know, this is really the terror, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so the, yeah, the, the, yeah. the massive surveillance state that uh, they're, they're bringing about, you know, that, that is, I guess, the most worrying part of the whole story. So tell us about, you, you believe that the, the mainstream media in, in France was propagandizing and, and breeding a fear within people to be afraid. I mean, what, 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 yeah. T- tell us about what was your experience of that? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's gone. I mean, it's a it's very, very sinister campaign, really. I mean, first of all, you know, as I said in that video, I mean, the, the war on terror is a fraud. There is no war on terror. I mean, the, the, if you, you only have to look at your, you know, NATO foreign policy for the last 20, 30 years, and even, even going back further than that. Um, NATO has been deeply complicit in domestic terrorism and in foreign terrorism, domestic terrorism through Operation Gladio. Any citizen who wants to be in Europe, who wants to be informed about how the state works and how the deep state works, needs to uh, read Daniele Ganser's book on this. Daniele Ganser was a researcher in Basel University, or still is, um, I believe, and uh, he, he, he was doing his PhD on this topic when 9-11 happened, I believe. And he, 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 was, the, he was the only dissertation uh, in the world, I think, on this topic. Because it hadn't been actually researched at all uh, in any political science department. And he wrote the first study of this. And it's a peer-reviewed study. He got his doctorate uh, with this. And it has come out as a, it's available in a book form as the NATO secret armies. And it's, I think it's a must read for anyone who wants to understand what NATO is, what its function is. And through, during the 1960s and 70, 1970s and 80s in particular, NATO uh, had these uh, groups called stay behinds, which were paramilitary groups, okay. extreme right wing paramilitary groups, uh, that they trained in, okay. um, in insurgency. Uh, methods uh, right. basically basically terrorism um, and the whole idea was that the Soviets were going to invade Europe 
And uh, if the Soviets invade Europe, these would be kind of resistance fighter armies, so they yeah. had kind of weapons ca- uh, stashed to away and so on. But of course, there was never any Soviet conspiracy to invade Europe. Um, and we've you know, many, many years now after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, and there's never been any documents uh, um, proving that the Soviet Union did have any plans to invade Europe. The purpose of it, of course, that was the official reason for this. But the, the real reason was they feared social revolt. Um, they feared social, uh, they feared left-wing movements. They, they were, well, had always been very strong in Italy, for example. And uh, the state, the mafia state in Italy, in West Germany, in, in, in Europe in general, um, was uh, completely run by Masonic lodges. So, for example, in Italy, you had the P2 Lodge. And it was basically composed of um, journalists, uh, military personnel, uh, academics, you know, all of the sort of ruling class of society. And um, the purpose of the attacks was to strengthen the power of the state and strengthen the power of, um, of the security services, make yeah. people look, look to the state for security, yeah. and uh, not to be seduced by, you know, subversive groups, uh, left-wing ideology, that kind of thing. And not, I suppose, you know, in a way, it's a way of disciplining um, the working class, you know, and yes. disciplining the, the more middle class. So, uh, and that was revealed, and again, it's not a theory, it's actually under official investigation by the European Union. There is actually um, an official investigation that's ongoing, and from time to time you will read small little articles in the French press. I I read a small little article in 2012, I think, in the French press, you know, um, in courts in uh, Luxembourg, uh, there, there was ongoing proceedings about this, and you know, that they did mention, they did quote some people who were mentioning, in fact, you know, the CIA were behind this. Uh, but it's never given any attention. I mean, it should be a major, yeah. it should be a yeah, big, big deal. Um, but so Gladio is something that everybody should know about if they want to understand terrorism. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that is absolutely essential. And then there's the far, so that's the domestic purpose of terrorism, if you like. Then you've got the foreign wars. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's very well documented that uh, the war against Libya had been planned many years in advance yeah. by uh, the French and the British and uh, the Americans. In uh-huh. 2010, the British and the French signed a um, military agreement in, uh, I think it was Lancaster, I think it's called the Lancaster Treaty. I have to look that up again, but I think it is. Uh, in any case, Sarkozy and Cameron signed a military agreement, which was kind of uh, unprecedented in terms of cooperation between the British and the French military. And they um, they had a war games um, plan. They had a plan to, to, to do an, a joint military operation that was planned for March of 2011. And the war games plan was called Operation South uh, Mistral, I believe. And that basically involved... Um, the French and the British uh, bombing a southern hemisphere state ruled by a dictator who was killing his own people. That was basically the war game scenario. And uh, that was planned for about the 20, I think the 25th of uh, March in 2011. And uh, lo and behold, it, it happened. I and mean, on the 18th of March 2011, you had UN, UN Resolution 1973 uh, mandating uh, the so-called humanitarian bombing of Libya. Um, so uh, the, what's the point? The point I'm making is that uh, that operation involved uh, arming, training, funding the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which had been a, a fighting group trained in Sudan in the 1970s by the CIA um, and uh, had been used against Gaddafi before. They, uh, a lot of their leaders were in exile in the United States. They were brought back um, and uh, what they did in Libya is they um, attacked a, a police barracks um, at the very start of the conflict in Benghazi, and they took out the officers and shot them in the head, and then said Gaddafi did this. These, these were officers who refused to shoot against their own people that were killed by Gaddafi for that reason. So that was the original, if you like, story that launched that launched the Libyan war. And then, of course, you had the racist card was played there as well, the, uh, the so-called African mercenaries. And that was yeah. uh, that the racist uh, story that was used to incite, incite racism among the rebels themselves and um, drum up support, you know, fear and so on. 
that was launched by Amnesty International and has been admitted by them. Um, so the human rights organizations yeah. are deeply complicit in these wars. Yeah. There are two, if you like, internationals in these wars. You have the human rights um, yeah. organizations. Uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch are the most notorious. Um, and then you have the Jihadist International. Um, the Jihadist International is composed of young, um, naive, working class, uh, disenfranchised, poor uh, individuals if, from the kind of lumpen proletariat of modern metropolises like London and Paris and Berlin and, and, and Dublin and so on. And they're, they're, they're recruited through imams who are kind of um, intermediaries. A lot of them are agents and double agents, you know. Um, courts openly tolerated by the imperial uh -huh. states. We see that a lot in London. London is definitely the you know, center of these kind of guys. I mean, they preach publicly in the streets and they, they go on marches calling for yeah. jihad and, you know, I mean, it's openly tolerated. And um, and they are very, very useful for foreign missions and they get sent out in these foreign missions. Their job uh, as Al-Qaeda, which, of course, means the database of military intelligence assets. Yes. The translation of Al-Qaeda in Arabic is, is a database, essentially. Yeah of um, U.S. military intelligence assets. As they go out there, that's what they're used as military intelligence assets to be used as lapdog shock troops against nation states like Syria who uh, refuse to become client states of the United States and uh, NATO and to recognize Israel, of course, as the hegemon in the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so the war on terror has always been about that. Israel is, of course, fundamental to the war on terror. Um, Israel's, you know, Israel does direct U.S. foreign policy and has an enormous influence over, um, over Congress and yeah. over the, um, you know, the, the, the Pentagon and uh, does direct European foreign policy as well. So it's a, it's a key state. Of course, Israel is not a country. It's a state without any uh, constitutional borders. So it's actually, okay. Israel is actually a global state. You know, it's a state that is just as active outside of occupied Palestine as it is in occupied Palestine. So it's, it's a very yeah. unique state in that sense. And it, uh, the long-term goal of the war on terror, in, particularly in the current phase in, in Syria, it, um, is to create a greater Israel in accordance with the Yinan plan, which is a, which is a paper that was written for um, an Israeli... Um, academic journal called Zionism and Judaism in 1982 by a, an Israeli uh, government official uh, called Oded Yenon. Oded Yenon wrote a paper um, about uh, in that journal called Kibbutzim, which is Hebrew for for directions, uh, about um, Israel's future, in which he described how Israel needed to essentially divide all of the Arab, straight, uh, Arab countries on ethnic lines. So you basically, this is, of course, traditional imperial strategy. You, you basically pitch the Christians, oh. against, uh, the Muslims against Christians and Christians against Muslims, and um, Egypt would be divided between the Copts and, 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 and the Coptic Christians and, and, and the, the, the Muslims. Uh, Syria would be broken up into four parts. And it's all very um, clearly described in that document. Uh, which is an official document. I mean, it's, it was actually it was actually translated from Hebrew by a, an Israeli scholar called Shaz Shahak. I, I may be wrong now with his name, but um, he's very well known. I think he was the leader of the international the Israeli section of the uh, International Rights Human Rights League or something like that. Okay, okay. Shahak. I forget his first name now, but uh, right. anyway, he, he he's the one actually translated it. Um, into English, and the, the, so the Yemen plan basically envisions um, breaking up all of the Arab states into kind of failed states, um, you know, um, fiefdoms uh, run by warlords and, and that kind of thing, so that the, those states can no longer pose a threat to Israel. So it's very, very logical for me, the Israeli point of view, a very rational plan from Israel's point of view, because Israel um, has nothing but enemies all around it. So in a way, so as a military plan, it's, a, yeah. it's an ingenious plan. Uh, of course, a catastrophe for the Arabs.
you know. Uh, so it's 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 you can see the logic behind yeah. it, and part uh, of the logic of destroying Libya was to basically, well, Libya of course had a huge, um, huge project. I mean, Gaddafi's African Unification Project was. Well, there was another thing that, that wasn't mentioned. The world had it worked, yeah. you know. So another thing that wasn't mentioned at all uh, to do with Gaddafi was the gold-backed dinar, the new currency, yeah. the currency which would have yeah. allowed the African nations to have controlled the money supply and taken them out of the, the Rothschild banking system. And this, this of course, Absolutely. is the foundation of why they had planned in advance to remove Gaddafi, who you know previously was on side and a good friend. Um, Absolutely. I'll tell you what, just, just, uh, just to move on a little bit, um, yeah. One of the big questions that I have is that from a strategic point of view, if I was ISIS, having done this in Paris means being destroyed in Syria. That doesn't make much strategic sense for someone from ISIS to, to, to order this attack. But it makes a great deal of sense if you want to have a Bashir Assad a, removed from power and your project to mm. have the proxy war remove him from power hasn't been working out for you. I mean, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, um, I'm not sure if I heard you right, because your, your, your voice isn't very really good, so I'm going to just assume I understand what you just said. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me properly, but your voice isn't very clear for me on, 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 on this line. But um, I'm just going to say well, what I think about uh, that. I think that you know the, the, the fundamental contradiction in French foreign policy right now is that you know, Bashar al-Assad is a secular, democratic, Republican leader. And I, I have no time for this nonsense about Syria being a dictatorship. I do not buy this notion at all. Um, you know, I would like to see a good example of a democracy in the world in the first place. I don't know what country would qualify. I would say that Cuba is probably the most democratic. But, and, and Libya certainly was, too, but, uh, because they were direct democracies. But, uh, so I don't buy this notion of there's only one type of democracy. So certainly our countries are not examples of democracy. They're very formal, right? You've got two parties usually in, you know, um, uh, and no change. Uh, so li Syria is just as democratic as any other country. They have a democratic constitution, and there are all sorts of rights in Syria. You've got freedom of expression, you've got freedom of movement. They're all, you know, and they're all on the in the 2012 constitution, and that's online, and you can read it. So it's not a dictatorship. Um, Assad is a modern, tolerant uh, leader. He's, a, I would describe him as a you know, a bourgeois, national, democratic, patriotic leader who um, is loved in Libya, or in Syria, sorry, because he uh, is kind of, the Assad, first of all, it's a sort of clanic society. So, you know, in, in societies where, tri where the tribe and the clan plays a leading role, you tend to have father-son kind of um, scenarios. And that's just, that, that's their problem. You know, if that's a problem, then the Syrians have to deal with that. That's just the way it is. And so Assad, you know, when he went for president and was elected president, first of all, I think he was particularly popular because his father had been so popular. And um, Henry Kissinger once described Hafez al-Assad as the most intelligent man he'd ever met. And, uh, you know, Kissinger, um, we both know the war criminal, but Kissinger knows, you know, Kissinger knows intelligence, he understands intelligence and uh -huh. intelligent leaders. Um, and so the Assad's, they, they kind of the virtue of the Assad is basically they managed to build Syria up and actually make it a viable nation state in, con in almost impossible conditions in the Middle East with the Golan Heights already, already occupied by Israel. And when you have Israel as a neighbor in the Middle East, you, are, you, know, you, know, you have no choice but to put um, checkpoints everywhere. You need, to, you need to watch that border. You need to have a very formative um, secret service for domestic surveillance and for, you know, foreign intelligence. That's going to mean a lot of militarization. It's going to mean a lot of conscription. They, the Syrians had to spend over 30% of their budget on the army, which is a huge, you know, um, burden on the country. In spite of all that, they provided free health care, free education. I mean, I was there in 2011 in Syria, and, like, it's a very open, it was a very open liberal country. You know, I mean, if you weren't uh, practicing Muslim, you could go to a bar and drink a whiskey and listen to rock music. And, you know, I mean, it was very Western and it was very um, tolerant. And, of course, the religious communities there were also very tolerant. I mean, I've met, yeah. I met people yeah. from the, both the Muslim and the Christian communities there. 
And it, in a way, it, you know, it, multiculturalism, in a sense, in Europe is deeply problematic. But multiculturalism, as it existed in Syria and Libya, was actually a success story. You know, so it's this deeply ironic. The West is just destroying multi-ethnic, multicultural, modern, secular, tolerant societies and using Islamist Wahhabi death squads to do that. So, uh, you know, if people understood that, they would realize that the real regime, regime change agenda needs to be here, not, not in these countries, you know. Um, and this yeah. is a tragic thing for Muslims because they are just being demonized here by these um, Wahhabi death squads. And it's just, when you talk to uh-huh. Syrians, you know, I mean, they're just completely excluded from the press. You never see any pro Assad people on the press here. Um, yeah. In Paris, there's been a lot of intimidation against the Syrian, the pro-Assad Syrian community. They've been prevented from having meetings. I've been at meetings where um, there have violence has broken out yeah. with pro rebel people, thugs coming into the um, the amphitheater and you know threatening violence. Uh, please do nothing about that. So you know, it's just heartbreaking to see that happening, and over and over and over again, you know. And then, of course, the, the thing about it is that the, the problem ends up just coming back on the streets anyway. Now now the Syrian war is here. So, you know, it's, it's a never-ending cycle of, of violence and despair, yeah. really. And what's not being discussed in terms of uh, the war in Syria is that Bashir Assad refuses to allow an oil pipeline to come from Saudi Arabia to the Mediterranean. Sure. And if, if it doesn't yeah, go that's... through, it will sell oil anyway, but it's going to go east. It'll go through Iran, Pakistan, and it will sell oil to China. And this whole thing sure. is a proxy war to decide, does the pipeline go east or does the pipeline go west? And sure. that's why they needed several... ISIS to try and take out Assad. Yeah, I mean, you, exactly. I mean, the pipelines are a huge part of it because you had the 2011 agreement between Iran, Iraq, and Syria uh, to bring Iranian gas from the powered gas field up through Iraq and Syria into the eastern Mediterranean. That was deal was signed by those three governments in conjunction with kind of Russian, with the Russians being okay with that, and um, that would be that would supply Europe with gas. And um, that's what you know those, those countries want. And the Americans are trying to get another gas pipeline, which goes from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and into Israel. And uh, if that works, of course, Israel would would become a major um, supplier of gas. And of course, the Israelis are, are covering the oil fields that have been found in Ga- uh, uh, off the coast of Gaza, you know, which technically are should belong to the Palestinian Authority, and okay. there's major gas has been found there. There's also been recent gas discoveries in the Golan Heights, uh, which of course is Syrian, but occupied by Israel. And then you have a major gas discovery as well in Egypt. So then, you know, these, 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 um, there's no shortage of energy, really. You know, all this peak oil stuff, <laughs> you know, a few years ago, I, I don't hear much about it now. People seem to be discovering more gas and oil all the time. But they, 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 um, well, apparently the Saudis are running out of it. And uh, one of the reasons for their bombing of uh, Yemen is because the border area between Saudi Arabia and Yemen has a lot of gas, and um, the Saudis want to get control of that area. But um, to, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the 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 gas pipelines are a big big a big part of all of this, and um, you know it's all about whether Iran and Russia become the main partners of the European Union or the you know the Gulf monarchies in Israel. And uh, the Americans want the Gulf monarchies in Israel and, and the Russians are um, you know wanted the the the, the, um, the Iraqi, Iran, Syrian pipeline to work out. So there there are even more complications when we go into places like Azerbaijan because they've got a major um, there's a major initiative as well to pipe oil from the Caspian Sea uh, through um, uh, Turkmenistan and uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan yeah. into Europe and it's called the, you know, the Trans-Caspian Pipeline and that's another issue and again there's huge issues there with Russia and Iran as well so in a way I think negotiations with Syria when they get sit down to negotiation I'm sure that's all they're talking about you know, 
the moving pawns on chessboard and saying, look, if we do this, what do we do? And, and, you know, what do we hear in the media? Human rights, democracy, all of this complete nonsense. Um, these human rights organizations, for me, are just criminal organizations and should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. Um, yeah, absolutely. I tried dialoguing with people from Interna Amnesty International and have just been shocked by their arrogance and their just sheer callousness. You know, they're just so callous and they're so stuck up and arrogant and, you know, they, they won't look at anything. Uh, they won't look at any evidence. They're, they're well paid, these guys, yeah? They, they've got good salaries, you know? When you tell yeah. it, these guys, that's, that's what they're in it for. They get, they get good money for this work. And, 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 and like, you know, all those corporate journalists, I mean, I was in the hotel in Festa Republic just a few nights ago doing um, two interviews there where all of the, you know, the corporate uh, yeah, media yeah. were there, <laughs> CNN and BBC and all the, yeah, I mean, and yeah. these people, you know, they spend most of the time talking about the new Porsche, you know, that's all they're interested in. They're not, yeah. no, that's they're that's not the, they don't want to find out what's really happening, you know, they have the script, they read it and, so, you know, the, in, you know in recent times, there's been a, a massive movement of immigration, uh, people moving outside of the the war zone to escape the, the death coming through Europe. It, it's, it's caused a great deal of um, a discussion, put it that way. But you've mentioned yeah. a, a coercive, engineered migration. Mm. Now, could, could you expand yeah. on what you mean by that, please? Okay, well, first of all, you need to just look at... Uh, so we may start with just the basic um, geopolitics of this, right? Uh, I mentioned Halford McKinder is the father of, of geopolitics uh, as a discipline. And McKinder's, McKinder looked at the world and basically saw, uh, you know, leaving out Australia, basically saw um, two islands. You've got the American island on one side, and the other one is uh, Eurasia and Africa, which actually, if you look at the map, I know the Suez Canal is dividing. Africa from Eurasia, but there, there's basically an island. One, it's a big landmass, Eurasia and Africa. So he called that the world island. And the, um, the objective of British domination in the world for McKinder was to divide the world island, um, divide uh, Western Europe from, um, from uh, the, or rather the European peninsula from the Eurasian landmass. And um, the uh, and that this would basically uh, prevent German ingenuity and Russian natural resources from being unified, and the British, through that sort of divide and conquer, could then dominate the world. They could dominate Europe. They could weaken Russia. And part of the the British presence in Afghanistan in the 19th century, the Great Game, was um, was about that and um, preventing. Russia was a rising empire, and of course, we knew that Russia was, according to McKinder, Russia it was the center of the world, essentially. And so if Russia could eventually become the dominant power in Europe, in other words, allied with Germany, that would begin the British domination of the world. So you're seeing part two of that with Brzezinski, it's a bit of Brzezinski. When he creates Al-Qaeda in the 1980s um, in Afghanistan, it's basically the same thing. It's a proxy war against, against the Soviet Union. And that falls, you still have yeah. the resurgence of the Soviet Union, and now you have basically the next phase of that. Now, the American, so that, that is standard geopolitics, and it's kind of something that hasn't changed in, in the way that the Americans uh, see the world. They, they know that if the Western island, that is to say America, North and South, is to um, dominate um, uh, the world island, then it must divide it from, that, from, that, from the Baltic Sea through the Black Sea and down to the Eastern Mediterranean. Let's make a, cur a corridor there, a curtain, if you like, um, and, uh, and divide the European Peninsula from yeah. the Eurasian yeah. landmass. And th th so that is a key strategic objective of the United States. Now, in the 20th, 21st century, um, the most important military strategist of the Pentagon is uh, Thomas P.M. Uh, Barnett, and he is known as the Grand Strategist. He was the Grand Strategist. He works with uh, Wikistrat, in, uh, which is based in Tel Aviv, and again, it shows you the, you okay. know, the, the close nature of the, the relationship between the United States and Israel. Um, and uh, Wiki, incidentally, Wikistrat uh, is one of the chief strategic 
think uh, tanks of AFRICOM, which is the uh, Pentagon's attempt to recolonize all of Africa and and, and pillage its resources. Now, the the strategy of of that laid out by uh, Barnett is that in the 21st century, the United States will, to maintain its dominance, it must, um, it can only tolerate two complete competing powers. And, then, and for him, those competing powers will be India and China. Uh, Russia must be destroyed, and Europe must, uh, in, in order to destroy Russia, if you like, Europe must be sacrificed. And so the, uh, what he see, the way he sees uh, that happening is um, you must uh, have uh, increased flows uh, of immigration into Europe from the African continent, because you're going to have an explosion. Of, you already have a, a youth bulge in, in Africa, it's a very, it's a demographically very healthy uh, continent, and in Europe, of course, is demographically unhealthy um, uh, due to the contradiction of capitalism. Germany, for example, in East Germany, um, yeah. they had a very healthy demography, for you know, because they pro-family policies, and it wasn't all about making money. And yeah. there's West Germany, it's all about money, and people are not having kids anymore. So, uh, so Europe is getting old; it's aging and it's dying. Africa's got, Africa's got a youth bulge. That's been known by sociologists for a long time. A very famous German sociologist, whose name is Gunnar Heinzon, has written some really interesting stuff about this. And he predicted this, actually, 10 years ago. He said that there is going to be a major youth bulge, and it's going to be, all these youth are going to come to Europe. Um, now, the, the, the thing about this is that um, Gaddafi, uh, Gaddafi had a kind of a contract with Europe. To, yeah. to stop the mass immigration. And, Gaddafi, and it was actually very logical because Gaddafi wanted to actually populate Libya more because it's a very unpopulated country with massive potential. And again, it was a very stable, multi-ethnic, multicultural model that was working. I mean, Libya was not only, not only had sub-Saharan Africans coming into Libya, you had um, a lot of Eastern Europeans moving there as well. So Libya was a real immigration country because it was basically a desert, but it was being retained through the man-made river project and all these things. The European Union deliberately, uh, well, the Americans, I would say even more, deliberately sabotaged that by destroying Libya. That released the flow in, into Europe. And then, of course, they destroyed uh, Syria and all of the other countries. They destroyed all these other countries right across Africa. Um, but, uh, so, it, you, so you not, the, the flow of people into Europe, the mass migration to Europe, these are the consequence of all these issues, demographics, globalization, and the wars. But then there's another element, which is actually this, this thing I mentioned, which is um, coercive engineered migration. And that is a concept yeah. that Kelly Duino, U.S. academic and government advisor, she wrote a book about this, and she's, she's an advisor to the government. It was a policy book. Okay. Um, and it documents about 56 cases of coercive engineered migration since the 1950s, where one state starts using migrants as a weapon with which to destabilize another state and put pressure okay. on that state and let that state uh, do what it wants. And so what is happening in Europe now is a lot of these migrants are actually being paid, their migration has been paid for by U.S. agencies. And that was revealed, yeah. that was confirmed recently by Austrian intelligence. Austrian intelligence sources uh, leaked information to InfoDirect, which is a, an Austrian uh, magazine, um, okay. saying that the Americans essentially were paying for this. And this is part of... Um, Barnett's strategy, uh, flow strategy, that Europe essentially, through mass migration, will collapse as European societies will collapse because, uh, first of all, you've got economic crisis, there's no work in Europe. And secondly, um, uh, the, 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 the youth coming in, there, there's, you know, there's, there are no facilities, uh, the, 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 the states are all bankrupt. Um, uh-huh. Uh, and not only that, but it's just obviously when you have that massive migration, it's going to create all sorts of problems. You can see that in working class areas in, in Italy, where, yeah. you know, all the working class people are literally, you know, they're, they're in despair. Uh, they, they just don't know what's happening. And you see that in Greece. So, so you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, this is not natural innovation. This is, not, this is actually, this is what is happening. It's a destabilization. And that's the reason why the... the Hungary, the Hungarians um, put up the fence. It was a very smart move by Hungary. Hungary, of course, kicked out the IMF, and Hungary is a country that is going to be targeted, has already been targeted by the Americans, even though it's a NATO member, it's, it's really attempting to get out of NATO. Of, uh, NATO. It's, close, it's a close uh, collaborator with Venezuela. Yeah. It's, um, 
uh, it has a lot of very interesting projects in Venezuela. Actually, one of the most amazing projects I've seen in recent years is with solar energy. And it's a joint Venezuelan and Hungarian project. Uh, they work closely with China, and they're very and they're very close to the Russians. So okay. Orban is kind of a right wing conservative Christian, but he's definitely outside of the the norm of politics, if you like. What he's doing, I think, in terms of getting rid of the IMF, is a really an amazing thing. And he's kind of, a, he's pushing a multi-vector, multi-polar foreign policy. And he's definitely out of sync with the European Union. And so he's being targeted by NGOs funded by Soros and the United States. And uh-huh. they're what they want, the, the part of the reason why they're targeting Hungary is they just want to create havoc in Hungary and, and overthrow Orban. And that could be through a color revolution. We should understand that in color revolutions, which I've covered a lot, the U.S. often just buses people into the country. Like, this happened in Belarus in 2010. They literally uh-huh. bust people from neighboring countries, thousands of people into the country, to put them in public squares to, to make them look like revolutionaries. And this was happening in Syria. When I was in Syria in 2011, the Syrians obviously understood what was happening in the Arab Spring. And um, okay. I remember talking to some people and other people saying, oh, they're not Syrians, they've got Egyptian accents. So they knew that there were Egyptian ac- um, activists and Tunisian activists and other um, people in the country uh, for purposes of subversion. So what what is going to happen is this. Um, the, the, the strategic objective of the United States is to uh, get as many of these migrants into Europe as possible, uh, use them as, 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 a, as a course of measure and as a, a measure of destabilization. The Balkans, uh, all of the countries in the East are dying because of capitalism. Essentially, they kind of having families anymore. So there's a demographic crisis, and the Muslim populations are, are growing. And of course, the, the Muslim populations are being Wahhabized by our allies, the, yeah. the, the, you know, the Turks, the, the Qataris, the Saudis, and yeah. um, so that, that's not going to work. That's not going to work for anyone, you know. Um, and th- that is happening in all these countries now. The Balkan countries are former colonies of the Turks. So it's the Balkan country, the, the big fear in places like Bulgaria, Serbia, and these countries is that you know, they've experienced Ottoman colonialism in the past, and so has Turkey, and so has um, Hungary, by the way. And, you know, they don't want that again. And this is a kind of a reverse colonization. The first colonization of the Balkans was actually refugees. Uh, refugees have a huge part to play in it. Um, so in colonization is something that, you know, it's often done by working-class people. And so that working-class people come into a country, they kind of got no choice. They're victims too. But the powers behind it are deliberately changing the demographics of that country to take it over. Yeah. So that yeah. they, one has to understand that the refugees coming in should not be blamed for the problem. They too are victims. They're actually being oh, Of course. Absolutely. As, as, as you know, um, it, it's the powers behind it. So Turkey, in this case, wants to gain control of the Balkans. Turkey risks losing control of, of, uh, of Syria, because Tur- the Turks yeah, yeah. basically are the main force behind Syria. The Kurds are being... Uh, uh, there's a lot of geopolitical changes taking place there, and I think that the Kurds will... Um, if the if they, Israelis are trying to get the control of the Kurds, and so if they do, uh, you may have a Kur- the Greater Kurdistan uh, being built there, and the Turks might lose a lot of, a lot of their territory. But in, 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 I think the idea is to give them the Balkans instead. And yeah, in, in any case, the, the Turks, um, the, the Turks are going to through immigration get more and more influence in the Balkans. If they come into the European Union, they will be the main military force. They're huge military. Uh, they have huge military capacity. That's what the United States wants because the United States wants yeah. to create an intermarium, which is a kind of a, a basically a, a block, a military block as I say, going from the Baltic Sea to the Black yeah. Sea against Russia to prevent Russian-German unification. And yeah. um, what they will do, they're building up Poland and Lithuania into a kind of a commonwealth. The old commonwealth idea is being revived. They're militarizing the hell out of Poland. Poland, of course, is staying very Catholic and very kind of, in a very sectarian way, uh, yeah. you know, kind of anti-Muslim. That, that serves their purpose as well, because the Poles will be the kind of, you know, the, the, the Christ, Christian Europe, and then the Balkans will be Wahhabized. And so there'll be potential conflict as well between Poland and Turkey. And, you know, if you listen to George Friedman from Strasbourg, he says that that will be in the major war in the 21st century, will be Poland and Turkey. And what they're going to do first is they want to pitch Turkey and Poland 
against Russia and use them. So as, as Turkey gets more and more powerful, it will be funding destabilization within the Russian Federation. And Poland, of course, will do the same. And when they're finished, if they manage to break up Russia, then they will use uh, Poland and, um, and Turkey against each other, just like the Iran-Iraq war. That's what I think, anyway. Um, okay. So that eventually you will then, you know, um, have everyone pretty much destroyed. But I yeah. think that the European, Western European countries are in big trouble. They're already in big trouble. Britain, okay. uh, Germany, France, Italy, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 Okay. Well, that, that's, people need to understand strategy. the strategic aspect of the refugee crisis. Yeah, okay, that's the strategy. Thanks for that. Uh, Craig Craig Sheridan has asked, uh, so what, what's best? Would it be best to have a, a Russian-backed Assad to remain in power in Syria to counter the US influence? Or does that lead us towards a larger conflict in the future? I mean... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say the obvious thing is to back Assad, you know. Yeah. Um, because I mean, Assad is the biggest enemy of Islamist terrorism in the world, and I think a lot of people here, and even I, I'm even beginning to read some elements of sanity in the French press, they're finally beginning to admit, you know, we should be backing Assad. I think people have been so brainwashed by their own propaganda that they're now beginning to see, you know, why, why, why are we demonizing Assad? You know, um, so the obvious thing for Syria is to leave Assad, and the Syrians will find will sort out their own future once um, once there's peace there. And, uh, Assad has huge popularity, of course. I mean, most of the Syrians support him anyway. And yeah. I'm not saying by any means that the Syrian regime and the Syrian government, always referred to as regime, is perfect. It's far from perfect. I'm sure that it's committed all sorts of crimes in, in Syria throughout the years, like any state. But uh, the, 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 uh, Assad is key to stability in, in the region and, and in Syria. So, you know, the people should be, should be supporting Assad in any case because... Um, in international law, every state has the right to exist and the right to defend itself, and he is the legal, the legally constituted leader of that country, whether you like it or yeah. not. Yeah. That's the way it is, and it, it, states have to recognize other states. Otherwise, you know, we, we can't be going around saying, "Oh, well, you know, he's he's father's son." And, 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 and in any case, who are we to talk? I mean, look at the United States: George Bush the first, George Bush the second, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton. Most Western politics is pretty much a family affair, anyway. So it's not as if there's anything unusual about kind of presidential republics where clans are in control. So I think that the, the, those issues, of course, are, are nothing to do with it. But I would say, yes, Assad is absolutely key to stability in, in Syria. Okay, I've got a question here from, from Sonny Williams. Uh, what do you think the overall solution is to dismantling the iron grip of the globalists? So they, the, the, well, the, the, the iron grip of, global, of globalists, I, I would say, well, first, well, I, I, this is a communist speaking, I suppose, I would say the, the extraction of surplus labor from capital, that's, that, this is what this is about. I mean, it's a triumph of, of capital over labor. That's the reason why you have um, globalization in its current form. Um, it, it really comes down to, you know, the, the, fighting the boss in your local factory and uh, yeah. joining unions and, and teaching them about it. Um, there is, I don't uh, I kind of subscribe to the notion that uh, this is something outside of capitalism. I see this as an emanation of, capi of the triumph of capitalism. And it can only be defeated uh, if uh, capitalism is defeated. Because, you know, as Lenin pointed out, um, capitalism, essentially, uh, imperialism is capitalism in its monopoly form. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a world now run by corporations. And that's because yeah. of the triumph of, uh, of, 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 of capitalism, you know. Uh, look what happened, uh, the unions in, in, in Britain. Look at what happened, the, the workers during the Thatcher period. I mean, um, Western societies were completely gutted. And, and that, that was a struggle that was local. You know, this is, so the way, you know, you, we can talk about the... The big shots of globalization, you know, like the Bilderberg Group, group and things yeah, like that, yeah. they are emanations of the triumph of capital over labor. And so the way to defeat it is to, I would say, um, uh, we read communist history from a proletarian point of view and, and, and attack it uh, right at the, on the factory floor. And when you do that, uh, everything else will fall. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know... The the global elites are are there because of the triumph of their ideology. So it's a re, it's an ideological struggle, I think. 
Okay, well, we're, we're heading towards an hour, so uh, I don't think there are any more questions coming in, so we'll just sort of wrap this one up. So, Gerard, is there anything that you want to add to this discussion before we finish? Uh, no, I, I, not for the moment. I'm sure I will talk again sometime. That's, yeah, um, excellent. So, mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much for contributing. It's been great to have you on. Uh, it's, it's great, to have you on. Uh, great to talk to you as well, uh, David. Yeah, yeah thanks. So it's, it's great to have alternative uh, perspectives yeah, on what David. you know. Anytime. So we'll speak to you at some point in the future, Jared. So if you just want to remain on the line, what we'll do is we'll finish the stream uh, and we'll speak to you just in a, in a little minute when, once we're finished. So thanks very much to everyone who's joined us. Thank okay. you to okay. those of you okay, who have right. questions in. Uh, Kevin doing the technical support tonight. Great job. And we'll, we'll catch you soon, okay? Peace.